the underpinning core ideology that we are fed in the West is that we are competitive, selfish, that this is human nature. You know, that is in, in many ways the, the religion of neoliberalism. That's where it comes from. You think you know what it is to be human, but you don't. Yeah. All you know is how a human behaves in a power over paradigm. But what if you were to plug that human being into a completely different paradigm? For the past few hundred years, and especially in the last four decades, people on every continent have been increasingly at the mercy of a colonial, globalized economy. We've been imprisoned in a consumer society in which our needs are met by distant, anonymous corporations, in which external ideals of success are imposed upon us. This uh, competitiveness that uh, you have to prove yourself by how much faster you can climb and push down the others. And, and it's been a deformation of the human spirit, I do believe. But for hundreds of thousands of years, we evolved for a very different type of living. Tribalized. I don't mean tribalized as in ideological oppositionalism. I mean tribalized as I live with these 150 people. My survival is dependent on their survival. My contentment is dependent on their contentment. There's no brain system that supports competition. There's no brain system that's all about aggression. All, all these um, assumptions that uh, this society uh, ascribes to human nature. They don't exist in our newer physiology. And there's an ache now for people to discover who they are. We human beings didn't evolve for a hyper-individualized, competitive way of being. For most of our time on this planet, we lived in collaborative, intergenerational communities, deeply connected to the land and the waters that sustained us. This is why you can now see across the world, people have been pushed into this unnatural, high-rise way of living, disconnected from each other and from the earth. They're now developing a natural and almost biological hunger for community and connection to nature. I see that the more interests among young people uh, about the farming and moving, especially moving outside uh, of uh, big cities, they are very, very uh, hungry for uh, communal bonds. So I see some, something very important is happening here. And the young people in Brazil are already showing that they want this um, ecological future and local future, locally based and deeply weaved within territory to exist. And they um, came together within a, mu a movement that we called localization. Beyond the mainstream media, on the ground on every continent, a quiet revolution is emerging. People are seeking community, collaboration, ways of life that nurture the natural world instead of destroying it. Farmers markets, small business alliances, transition towns, mutual aid networks, community banks, agroecology schools, alternative education, permaculture, eco-villages and more. Collectively, these diverse initiatives demonstrate a new path forward for humanity. It's a path that localizes rather than globalizes, connects rather than separates, and shows us that human beings need not be the problem. We can be the solution. We are 
facing an emerging global civilization and the danger of global monoculture and it is this danger that can be countered by the localization movement it is localization that can em- enable the emergence of diversity identity autonomy and resilience This is a time for localization. It's modest, it's simple. Almost beguilingly simple. Um, but it's also complex. It also means that we have to shape shift. It also means we have to be different. In local economies, people can see their impact on others and on nature. This is a human scale where the structures create transparency and accountability and bring out the best in people. This for me is the strongest argument for localization. When people work locally, they look after what they're working with. They have a longer horizon. They're not thinking to the next shareholder meeting, to the next quarterly profits review. They're thinking, what would this be like for my children and grandchildren? That kind of long-term vision is profoundly ecological. People want to uh, experience their responsibility. And that means that you carry yourself with pride and dignity because you matter. What makes a human being happy I don't want to trivialize that question, but I would say that it is multidimensional relationships, relationships to each other, to other people, to non-human beings, to a place. You create together. You meet physical needs for each other. You are embedded and you could say of a place, not just a separate self but you are part of a circle, uh, of, of, of a circle of circles of circles of circles of relationships. Therefore, you know who you are. Therefore, you have a sense of belonging. So what Mahatma Gandhi calls Swadeshi, meaning economics of the place, and we celebrate the diversity of cultures and diversity of religions and diversity of languages, but we keep ourselves rooted in the place we, where we live. When it comes to food, when it comes to the way that we organize power, when it comes to the way we organize health, and even, I would say, issues as um, potentially complex as justice, we need to localize where possible. Thanks to globalization, the food we eat travels thousands of miles. Shrimp from Scotland is shipped 6,000 miles to Thailand just to be peeled, then shipped back to be sold in the UK. Meanwhile, countries routinely import and export huge quantities of the same product. In 2020, Germany was the world's second largest importer of milk and also the world's second largest exporter of milk. That same year, the U.S. imported $3.5 billion worth of beef and exported $3.75 billion worth. Many countries engage in this kind of redundant trade. This is insanity in an era of climate chaos, but global trade rules actually encourage it. All the international maritime and air uh, transportation, the emissions from this are not accounted by any country. Just think of all those vessels with all kinds of commodities from China to everywhere, uh, from mining with soy, with oil, with liquefied gas. 
those emissions are nobody's emission because one of the key assumptions of the climate policy is that you cannot harm trade. The global market pressures towards vast, chemical-intensive, monoculture-based farming. These monocultures actually produce less food while eliminating biodiversity and destroying small farmers. Local markets, on the other hand, require a variety of different products and so they unleash the productive and truly regenerative power of small-scale, diversified farming. Permaculture has contributed to that acknowledgement and importance of these smaller localised economies for radically reducing ecological fo footprint. It's desperately important that we take control in our communities of our food to eat food grown locally as much as possible. Saving seeds, learning from our nature, learning from farmers, we can grow enough food to feed all of India twice over by conserving biodiversity, regenerating the soil, regenerating the water, and healing the broken climate cycle. Agriculture uses half of all habitable land, so a shift from global monocultures to localized, diversified food systems would literally transform the face of the earth. As people recognize the multiple benefits of local food economies, community initiatives are springing up across the world. We have over 1,500 urban gardens and farms now all across the city of Detroit. We are going to build a local ecosystem of food entrepreneurs, and we are about to build the most delicious local food economy on the planet, Earth. Ici, nous apprenons à produire les fruits, nous apprenons à produire le poisson, nous apprenons à produire le maïs, etc. Tout ce qui va concourir à nous nourrir, hein? tout ce qui va concourir, concourir à promouvoir l'économie locale, c'est-à-dire les richesses de notre terroir, c'est cela que nous visons. Mais si nous sommes là à consommer ce que les autres font tout le temps, on sera toujours pauvre et toujours esclave. Et c'est ça que je ne veux pas de la, de la nouvelle génération. The number of young people from the city want to come back to the farm is increased. They have strong intention that they want to do organic farming. Now we do a lot of training, mainly people from the city come. And many, most of them ready to quit their job. Many of them looking for land, many of them bought the land already. We have a madness in this world where food that is grown around our cities is largely exported to other areas, either within the country or even outside the country. And, um, wouldn't it be so much better if 
the local farmers had the opportunity to work with the local communities to bring their food into the city as was traditionally done. Bristol was once fed by peri-urban horticulture projects, like suburban market gardens, basically. Since 85, the amount of land given to this kind of agricultural production, suburban horticulture, has declined by almost 30%. In this country, it's really difficult for farmers, especially kind of new entrants to farming, to get access to land. So Bristol Food Producers is running a scheme of land matching where it tries to get people who want to have access to land to apply through Bristol Food Producers, and then it tries to match people with available land. We take pleasure in our day's work here and enjoy turning out plate food and watching people enjoy it, knowing that we know Patrick that's growing the mushroom that's on that plate. To use the products in the shop and to sell them, but also to celebrate the Bristol food movement, which is amazing. My name is Nelson Muzingwa. I'm a smallholder farmer in the Shashi block of farms. We are demonstrating and showcasing many of the practices that we relate to our local our processes of producing food and at the same time managing our environment. We believe it is a movement that is connecting different people in many different communities. They cannot survive in isolation. They would like to connect for them to be able to participate meaningfully and effectively in the politics about food systems. Then he is Sakat Po, then a dang the two Zanga that some scoops the Borchishin of the Nina Sakat and Mati Lakpanet in a Sodmik Tapchis Po, you know, We are a group of friends in Budapest involved in different activities dealing with sustainability and more social justice. We met and decided to launch an ambitious project for better well-being called Cargonomia. We would like to distribute healthy local food in Budapest with our self-manufactured cargo bikes. We bring all that food and also eggs, beers to Cargonomia in the city center of Budapest. From there, we distribute it to people in Budapest with our cargo bikes made in Cyclonomia. There's this widespread belief that we need big farms and ever more technology to feed the world. Actually, exactly the opposite is true. We need small-scale, diversified farms everywhere. Supporting this turnaround is an essential step in transforming the entire economic system and is something that we can all contribute to right now, wherever we are. Local food economies are essential for restoring our health and the health of the planet as a whole. But to build those kinds of economies, we must recapture our rights from global corporations. Beyond this uh, community effort, uh, localization must advocate for structural changes no, in the social and production relations between farmers, traders, and landlords. We hope to contribute in the building and strengthening 
of a global movement that will challenge the monopoly control of TNCs over food and agriculture. It starts with simple questions actually of where does my food come from? Where does my water come from? Who controls these systems? How are decisions made around these? And it starts to connect to larger social movements who are actually trying today to defend our territories, to defend the water resources, to defend uh, uh, control over our own knowledge systems. And we need policy reforms that supports localization and agroecology and community supported agriculture. The need to have strong uh, mass movements of farmers and small food producers of workers and consumers and all their advocates. So uh, we need to support and strengthen such a strong people's movement. How is it that we have allowed control of our food systems and our entire economy to be put into the hands of giant global institutions. So from the time of colonization, there was historical structuring or reorientation of domestic agriculture and food production towards sources of cheap raw materials for the industrial needs of the colonizers. So it continued with the neoliberal globalization of the past four decades. And they've used um, instruments like WTO, bilateral agreements, FTAs, as well as restructuring required by the international financial institutions such as World Bank and IMF. Since the 1980s, Governments worldwide have been signing on to trade treaties that give multinational banks and corporations more and more freedom and power. These treaties now even allow corporations to sue governments for any social or environmental protections that might threaten their profits. This makes a mockery of democracy. You know, what did globalization do? It tore down all the rules that allowed justice in society, democracy in society, equality in society, tore it all down and made it all possible to accumulate. So you get the tech billionaires emerging. You get the Black Rocks and the Vanguards. And this year, Black Rock is 9.5 trillion. 9.5 trillion in a decade. They own the media. Um, they, of course, own the whole financial infrastructure. Um, and so basically almost any aspect of our life today is dominated by these global corporations. And what's so terrifying about it is that they are structured legally with one mission above all, which is to increase shareholder profit, shareholder value as fast as possible. They want to reinforce the current unsustainable global system with the new technology. Now, as we move forward with this localizing movement, we have to be very, very careful with this word, new technology. Because now, multinational corporations are taking over our food system with that. Can you imagine a future where multinational companies serve us on the other side of the world? automatically manage the robots plowing the farming. The World Economic Forum has set the goal of digitalizing the whole world. In fact, Bayel has already collected 24 million hectares of digital data from all over the world. Saudi Aramco, where energy is opportunity. Governments on both left and right are rolling out the red carpet for these corporate giants. They're freeing them from regulation 
they're freeing them from paying taxes, and they're subsidizing the expansion of globalizing infrastructure. At the same time, citizens, small businesses, and even national industries are squeezed for taxes and burdened by ever more red tape and bureaucracy. That's why products from the other side of the world generally cost less than local products. It's why the gap between rich and poor is so extreme. It's a completely unfair economic playing field. We have a system that actively undermines the social network and destroys communities because it throws people out of jobs without any thought to the impact of what that will have on the local community. When a Walmart can come in and completely obliterate small local businesses, that is a huge impact on people's connection to each other and therefore on their health. One of the many reasons that the technological expansion in the West and now all over the world of the last few centuries is so toxic is that it has been intimately linked with the destruction of community. And uh, this is a breeding ground for all kinds of insecurities. According to Facebook's own research reported by the Wall Street Journal, their platforms make body image issues so, so if you look at the statistics and the number of people that are lonely, they've gone way up in the last 30, 40 years. Real epidemic of mental health conditions amongst the youth, increased youth suicide, depression, anxiety, all of which actually reflect the, the consequences of a system that denies children's developmental needs and fails to provide children or adults with a healthy, connected environment. Ultimately, these corporations only get their power by having to push down the actual deep instinct in every human being, every human infant that's born, to love, to be connected, to be part of community, to be part of life. But they have to actually stop that from growing. But people themselves want nothing more than to be part of community part of life, to feel desired within their community and to feel that they're making a meaningful difference to others around them. But will it lead to wage rises? We've assumed so before, wrongly. The majority of people are getting poorer. Governments are getting poorer. And even CEOs are running faster and faster in fear of losing their jobs in a merger. So why is anyone still going along with this globalizing madness? The system has become so vast, so global, that it's almost impossible to see its contours. And no one has been charged with stepping back to look at the big picture. Instead, economic pressures have been demanding ever more specialization and ever more narrow perspective. So this means that the problem is not so much about evil, greedy people in charge. It's much more about a lack of awareness, about ignorance, from the grassroots to the very pinnacle of power. This is actually quite good in many ways because the antidote to ignorance isn't complicated. It's about raising awareness. The globalized economic system that dominates our world is like the Pied Piper who led the children of Hamelin to their doom. With its enchanting glamour of media, consumerism and big business, globalization has led us to so many crises like climate change, ecological disasters, widening gap between the rich and the poor, uh, and increasing social violence and illnesses of all kinds. What gives us hope is the millions of deep thinkers and their initiatives that promote localization as a major systemic solution that we need to arrest our civilization's free fall to disaster. When we think local and we consume local, um, it makes for a healthier planet because the, the ripple effect it causes um, and, and the um, this community spaces that it creates is just beautiful. I'm trying to shift away from contributing to the fossil fuel economy in any way possible. 
uh, it makes so much sense because the only people making money in the whole economy seem to be the people who are extracting from uh, the system. Millions of local initiatives already exist in India for local agriculture, innumerable local crafts, creating local economies and much more. 93% of our total workforce of India is from the unorganized sector, which includes small and localized businesses. Gandhiji said, India needs production by the masses, not mass production. And that we need Gram Swaraj, which really means respect for localization. India is a country that still has over 20,000 varieties of rice, over 1,000 kinds of handlooms, over 120 major living languages, and we have diversity of all kinds. We still need to follow the wisdom of Gandhiji. Sabemos que el metabolismo de la economía globalizada es irreconciliable con la finitud del sistema biofísico. De esta manera en México como en Latinoamérica, por eso y ante esto se han construido y se han edificado diversidad, una diversidad de movimientos antiglobalizadores como movimientos de contracción, de resiliencia comunitaria. ¿Para qué? Para fortalecer en este tejido de las economías familiares. Y en esto, el papel de las mujeres ha sido crucial. Nuestro grupo somos 100 compañeras, 100 familias las que participan. Y siento que lo que más nos ha ayudado es a fortalecer la economía local. Y este año, bueno, a fin de año pasado, 2020, nos invitaron también a participar en un consejo por la defensa de aquellos compañeros que sufren la criminalización por defender su territorio. Worried customers have been snapping up everything in sight. Store shelves nationwide are dwindling or totally empty. We needed a pandemic to show us how resources need to actually flow and how localized action can create amazing local responses based on a new relatedness. In, a, in our emergency, we're kind of hardwired to help each other and small scale approaches are a very effective way to build re relationships of trust and meaning while serving needs. So one of the really dramatic consequences of the coronavirus pandemic is the rise all over the world of community-based mutual support groups. Some of them are amazing. At the same time, there's a growth in response to the longer term crisis of neoliberal capitalism, which has been devastating for 40 years. There's a growth of worker-owned enterprises, uh, collectives, uh, community-based services uh, spreading all over. One of the things that happens in uh, the midst of large-scale shocks and crises is that we realize very quickly how vulnerable our globalized supply chains are. And in the rocky world of climate chaos, we're seeing many more examples of this. Localization in this context is survival. We will be facing more shocks, more novel viruses, more cataclysmic storms. Our communities must prepare by becoming more self-sufficient, more able to provide for our basic food, energy, and medical needs. Self-sufficient is not the same as isolated or parochial or insular. I'm an internationalist. But more sturdy, more ready, and more resilient communities is what we need for when the next shock comes. In the modern world, we have been made to believe that globalizing economic development is inevitable. 
cookie cutter houses, bigger highways, homogenized main streets, concrete and high rise and corporate logos on every corner. We have called it progress and treated it as some kind of evolutionary force beyond our control. But all around the world, communities are exploring a diversity of place-based alternatives. We have to rebuild our local economies, our local societies, our local politics. And there's incredible, there's millions of movements around the world which are actually saying, no, we are the power, we claim the power where we are. We're not going to give it to politicians or to corporations. A community decides to manage shared wealth in ways that are participatory, fair, and peer-governed. And this happens outside of markets, outside of the state. It's people-driven. We see it in cooperatives and local currencies and time banking. We can see it in community forests and community-supported industry. The commons and localization are not fated to be small or you know, uninfluential because they're small. The strategy is to emulate and federate to federate horizontally so we can coordinate and trade knowledge and grow a bigger footprint while keeping the appropriate scale. And there is a master plan for developing the area and we've looked at it and thought, well, it's exactly as a master plan would be in the late 20th, early 21st century. And we as a community have come together and thought we can do better than this. So what we're looking at is how we can co-design a neighbourhood that's going to be answer the questions of growing inequality, climate change, um, and, and poor design and fragmented communities. We like to think of the transition movement as being a movement of communities who are reimagining and rebuilding the world, and they do so with a particular focus uh, on localization. Share is an empty shop that has been converted into a library of things. I am one of eight apprentices that have created Share, a library of things. So the Share shop is basically a physical hub for people to lend items to each other. So similar to a library, you can uh, borrow stuff, but it's not just books, but it's also yeah, wire items, tools, leisure, holiday equipment, all of that kind of thing. It reduces the amount of stuff that we need to have ourselves. You can come to the shop, repair your bike if it's got a puncture, you know, if you've got something else to fix, just to come down. There's such a huge range of possibilities of what this shop could be. When we treat economies and communities as local as opposed to global, we have a chance to exercise real power over the way our lives are run. This is going to require great regulation of many of these centralised uh, institutions, e.g. in the corporate world, in government. Let's create a fair playing field. Let's stop giving subsidies to big business. Let's get the tax code fair so that local economies have a fair chance to thrive. Let's stop using the farm bill to give 90% of our farm subsidies to the biggest farms. You know, if we go down the list, there are so many ways in which policy is working in favor of the big guys. And if we level that playing field, and if we recognize the various benefits that local businesses bring, I think we'll get very different outcomes. いのちをしっかりと守っていけるような法律を作っていくことによって日本国内においてもそうですし、ひいては世界においても、え、ソーシャルローカライゼーションの活動がしっかりできるようにしていきたいと思っています。え、よくし、ジョンジュエソド、地
make, and grow, and invest in the goods and the services that our communities need. That jobs and wealth were better in the hands of the many rather than the few. That as manufacturers, family farmers, independent retailers, as energy providers, or as community bankers, that we could all just decide that it was all right to care for each other. Here at Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, we know that real prosperity is local by its very nature. From Seattle to Cincinnati, Asheville to Minneapolis, New Orleans to Vancouver, BC, Bali is celebrating and recognizing, supporting and connecting the leaders of a new economy. Those communities in the United States with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. That in those communities with the highest number of locally owned businesses, there is the highest per capita income growth rate. In other words, the best way of reducing poverty, increasing equality, is to go local. We also know that local businesses are extremely profitable. This is from Canada, and what it shows is the most profitable businesses have 10 to 20 employees. The least profitable businesses are those that are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. How can we get the 99% of us to start putting money into great local businesses? Because if we do, we unleash not only great local economies, but we take the fuel out of the monsters of global capital. In Nova Scotia, there are communities that are now allowed to create local pension funds. And there are maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 of these pension funds. In New Brunswick, they just implemented a 50% tax credit. Every dollar that you put into a local business above $1,000 generates 50 cents of reduction in your taxes in provincial, in provincial tax obligations. These are serious, serious reforms. Localization addresses people's mounting concerns with the cost of living with their financial security. Simultaneously, it reduces emissions and other environmental destruction. It's a vision that bridges social and environmental issues, the rural and urban divide, and the political left and right. It's a unique opportunity to, to build a broad-based movement that could bring about fundamental systemic change. And I think we're seeing that, uh, a lot of pushback, a lot of people uh, pushing more to the right in their politics right around the world, is this cry out for more empowerment at a local level. They're sick of these decisions being made by corporations that are thousands of kilometres away from their own region, where they understand the nuance and what's required in their particular community. So the more that we can localise and give people back that power at that local level, I think we're going to see um, huge changes, not only environmentally, but also to the social fabric of what we're creating. Only the tiniest fraction of the global population is actively involved in promoting the continued globalisation of the economy. By contrast, those working for a fundamentally different future can be numbered in the hundreds of millions. Se pravi, prišli smo do meni, kako se bo treba resnično odločiti, v katero smer bomo šli, govorim v imenu človeštva, ali v smer, ki je človeku dana, torej k obdelovanju zemlje, k samoskrbi, k prevzemanju odgovornosti za naša lastna življenja ali pa v smer, ki nam je ponujena, torej v globalistično, kapitalistično družbo.
this is a vital time to do different kinds of activisms, different kinds of work. So power needs to change. Our notions of power need to change. If power is always at a distance, then we will frame economics and the economy as food coming from far away. And we will valorize, reify, ordain, and celebrate a system that denies us the immediacy of our surroundings. So do you see that the mission of this movement is uh, bigger than ever before? Let's keep moving for localizing the whole world so that one day we can brag to our children, our grandchildren, that uh, we did not give up at the critical moment to protect their future and our planet. And in Brazil, we say decolonizing our imagination. Stop thinking that industrialization is the only way to go and technology is the only way to go. There are other ways of living that is going to make us maybe even more happy. We have to take a stand for what we are recognizing as important and essential to our full human beingness. Move people away from this idea that we're in a kind of Darwinian struggle, one against the other, into the notion that we live in communities and we must help each other in communities. I'm not saying let's smash down cities and throw our iPhones out the window, let's keep them, but let's not prioritise the continual commodification and the continual advancement of uh, consumer goods as the dominant idea for our life. それが私たちがまさに生きること、いわゆるローカリゼーションだ。それが始まったと私ともそう思っています。どうかみんな頑張りましょう。The real change does not come from the top. Real change does not come from the center. Mahatma Gandhi did not work from the House of Parliament. Or president's house. Martin Luther King did not come from the White House. We have to focus on building grassroots movement stronger and stronger and stronger, and that is the future for the local economy and human scale paradigm. Economic localization aligns with fundamental principles of life, it protects and restores biodiversity. And it answers our deep, innate human need for connection. It's an unstoppable force. Thank you.